you know. Um, and it, it really sold quite well, and so that was the beginning. And then we decided to start meeting. Uh, and we made, we made about we'll leave the last few minutes of the senator's remarks to take you live to the Senate floor. At 5 Eastern, senators will vote on whether to advance the nomination of Michael Shipp to be a, f a judge in a federal district court in New Jersey. This is live Senate coverage here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Savior, our help in ages past, take our lawmakers to a safe refuge, for you are their strong defense. Let them find safety under your wings as you protect them with your constant love and faithfulness. Today, refresh our senators with your spirit. Quicken their thinking, reinforce their judgment, and strengthen their resolve to follow you. Show them what needs to be changed and give them the courage and wisdom to make the changes. Lord, we conclude this prayer by asking you to embrace with your arms of mercy the victims and the families affected by the tragic shooting in Aurora, Colorado. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., July 23, 2012. To the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I move to proceed to count number 467. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar 467, S. 3412, a bill to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to provide tax relief to middle class families. Mr. President, I now ask unanimous consent that the Senate now observe a moment of silence for the victims of the shooting in Colorado. Mr. President, this afternoon the Senate pauses <coughs> excuse me, to remember those killed in last week's horrific shooting in Colorado. Among the dead was 26-year-old Jonathan Blunk, graduate of Hug High School in Reno, Nevada, a Navy veteran, father of two. My heart goes out to his loved ones, to all the victims and their families as they struggle to make sense of the senselessness. How can you make sense of something that's so senseless, Mr. President? We may never know the motivation behind this terrible crime or understand why anyone would target so many innocent people. 
Friday's events were a reminder that nothing in this world is certain and that life is precious and short. Today we pause to mourn the dead, but also honor how they lived. And we pledge our support to the people of Aurora, Colorado, both as they grieve and as they begin to heal from this terrible tragedy. Mr. President, Public Mr. President we've all been sifting through the events of last Friday, and I think it's entirely appropriate for the Senate to take a moment today to acknowledge, as we just did, the victims of this nightmarish rampage, their families, and the wider community of Aurora. In the life of a nation, some events are just so terrible that they compel all of us to set aside our normal routines and preoccupations, step back, reflect on our own motivations and priorities, and think about the kind of lives we all aspire to live. This is certainly one of those times. <clears throat> and as is almost always the case in moments like this, the horror has been tempered somewhat by the acts of heroism and self-sacrifice that took place in the midst of the violence. I read one report that said three different young men sacrificed their own lives in protecting the young women they were with. And we know that the first responders and nurses and doctors saved lives too including the life of an unborn child. I think all of us were moved over the weekend by the stories we've heard about the victims themselves. It's hard not to be struck by how young most of them were, of how many dreams were extinguished so quickly and mercilessly. But we were also moved by the outpouring of compassion that followed and by the refusal of the people of Aurora to allow the monster who committed this crime to eclipse the memory of the people he killed. President Obama, Governor Hickenlooper, and the religious leaders in and around Aurora are to be commended for the time and effort they put into consoling the families of the victims and the broader community. I think the best thing uh, the rest of us can do right now is to show our respect for those who've been affected by this terrible and senseless crime and to continue to pray for the injured that they recover fully from their injuries. There are a few things more common in America than going out to a movie with friends, which is why the first response most of us had to the shootings in Aurora was to think it could have been any of us. It's the randomness of a crime like this that makes it impossible to understand and so hard to accept. But as the scripture says, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So we accept that some things we just can't explain. Evil is one of them. And we take comfort in the fact that while tragedy and loss persist, so does the goodness and generosity of so many. And now I'd like to join Governor Hickenlooper in honoring the victims by reciting their names. Veronica Moser Sullivan, Gordon Cowden, Matthew McQuinn, Alex Sullivan, Michaela Medique, John Larimer, Jesse Childress, Alexander Boyk, Jonathan Blunk, Rebecca Ann Wingo, Alexander Tevez, 
Jessica Gawley. We too will remember. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
Unanimous consent, further proceedings on the quorum call be suspended and I be recognized. Without objection. <clears throat> I rise again today to once again urge the Majority Leader of the United States Senate to bring to the floor for debate one of the most important pieces of legislation that comes before this body each year, the National Defense Authorization Bill. On several occasions, I have approached the Majority Leader and asked him to consider this legislation, legislation that for the last 50 years, this body has taken up, debated, amended, passed, conferenced with the House of Representatives, and sent to the President for the President's signature. Last week, the Majority Leader senator from Nevada, stated that Senate consideration of a controversial and flawed bill on cybersecurity, a bill that has not been considered in the regular order, is more important and of higher national security priority than the defense authorization bill. I respectfully but vehemently disagree with that statement. According to the majority leader, quote, and I quote, we're going to have to get to cybersecurity before we get to the defense authorization bill because on the relative merits, cybersecurity is more important. Let me repeat this again. The majority leader of the Senate is arguing that legislation dealing with cybersecurity which is a subset of national security, of national defense, is more important than legislation responsible for ensuring that the men and women of the armed forces have the resources and authorities necessary to ensure our national security. A bizarre statement. I have been involved in national security issues for a long time. I have been involved with the, with the bills concerning national defense, and I have never heard a statement that cybersecurity is more important than the overall security of this country. That either was the majority leader misspeaking or the majority having a lack of understanding of what national security is all about. He's arguing that a controversial and flawed bill on cybersecurity, a bill of such significance that it has languished for the over five months at the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, no committee markup or normal committee process, no amendments, and it should take precedence over a bill which was vetted for over a period of four months by the Senate Armed Services Committee and reported to the floor with the unanimous support of all 26 members, which certainly would not have been the case if there had been a vote on cybersecurity legislation as it is presently propo proposed, because I was a member, I am a member of that committee, and I and others certainly would never have supported this legislation, and at least we should have been allowed amend the amendment process. But that's not the case with, quote, cybersecurity. Also, I might add, I understand we will have to have a motion to proceed, which then will drag us into next week, when we could, I emphasize could, finish the defense authorization bill in one week and at most two. I remind my colleagues <clears throat> that consideration of the defense authorization bill is more than a simple right of this body. It's an obligation to our national defense and a fulfillment of our responsibility to the men and women in uniform that the Senate has honored 
over the past 50 consecutive years. I'd say to my colleagues, today I went out to Bethesda, Walter Reed, to visit with our wounded. It's always a, an uplifting and always an incredible experience for me to make that visit. Can't we, can't we as a body, for the sake of those men and women whose lives are on the line, pass a defense authorization bill that's responsible for their security, their training, their weapons, their equipment, their morale, their welfare? Can't we pass a defense authorization bill through this body? Are we so parochial? Is the Senate Majority Leader oblivious to the needs of the men and women who are serving this nation? They deserve better than what they're getting from the leadership today of this United States Senate. The Senate Armed Services Committee version of the fiscal year 2013 National Defense Authorization Act provides $525 billion for the base budget of the Defense Department, $88 billion for operations in Afghanistan and around the world, and $17.8 billion to maintain our nuclear deterrent. In the area of pay and compensation, the bill authorizes $135 billion for military personnel, including costs of pay, allowances, bonuses, and a 1.7 percent across the board pay raise for all members of the uniform services, consistent with the President's request. The bill improves the quality of life of the men and women in the active and reserve components of the all-volunteer force and helps to address the needs of the wounded service members and their families. It also authorizes important military construction and family housing projects that cannot proceed without specific authorization. All major weapons systems are authorized in this legislation, including those that will benefit by the committee's continuous, rigorous oversight of poorly performing programs. Every piece of equipment, large or small, that the Department of Defense needs to develop or procure is authorized in that legislation. With the planned reductions in Afghanistan, the importance of providing for our deployed troops while training and transitioning responsibilities to the Afghan forces has never been more important. The bill provides our servicemen and women with the resources, training, equipment, and authorities they need to succeed in combat and stability or operations. It also enhances the capability of U.S. forces to support the Afghan National Security Forces and Afghan local police as they assume responsibility for security throughout Afghanistan by the year 2014. The bill contains important initiatives intended to ensure proper stewardship by the Department of Taxpayer Dollars by, among other things, codifying the 2014 goal for it to achieve an auditable statement of budgetary resources, strictly limiting the use of cost-type contracts for the production of major weapon systems, requiring the Department of Defense to review its existing profit guidelines and revise them as necessary to ensure an appropriate link between contractor profits and contractor performance, enhancing protections for contractor employee whistleblowers and restricting the use of abusive, quote, pass-through contracts. Another vitally important provision in the bill repeals provisions of last year's National Defense Authorization Act that threatened to upset the delicate balance between the public sector and the private sector in the maintenance and repair of military systems. And the bill addresses many other important national security policy issues. With respect to cybersecurity, I'm in full agreement that the threat we face in the cyber domain is among the most significant and challenging threats of 21st century warfare. This threat was made even more evident by the recent leaks about Stuxnet coming from this administration. That's why the Defense Authorization Bill takes great steps to improve our capabilities by consolidating defense networks, 
to improve security and management and allow critical personnel to be reassigned in support of offensive cyber missions, which are presently understaffed. It also provides policy guidance to the Department of Defense to address the clear need for retaliatory capabilities to serve both as a, deter a deterrence to and to respond in the event of a cyber attack. Based on the procedures the Senate has been following over the past few years, with little or no opportunity for debate and amendments, the Majority Leader apparently intends to rush through the Senate a flawed piece of legislation. The cybersecurity bill that he intends to call up later this week is greatly in need of improvement, both in the area of information sharing among all, sharing among all federal agencies and the appropriate approach to ensuring critical infrastructure protection. Without significant amendment, the current bill the Majority Leader intends to push through the Senate has zero chance of passing the House of Representatives or even being, ever being signed into law. Whereas the Defense Authorization Bill, we take it up and pass it, clearly we would have a successful conference with the House and we would send it after voting on the conference bill, send it to the President for his signature. There is no chance that the cybersecurity bill that the President, United, that, that the majority leader wants to bring to the floor will have a chance of passage in the House of Representatives. So here's the choice. Take up the defense authorization bill, which has important cybersecurity provisions in it and provides for the overall defense of the nation, or take up a flawed bill that never went through the committee, was never amended, and take it to the floor of the House, use up a week while we go through the motion to proceed, and then maybe pass it, maybe not, and not have it even considered by the other body during the month of September, which is the last we will be in session before the election. So for the life of me, I do not understand why the majority leader of the United States Senate should have so little regard for the needs of the men and women who are serving in the military today. And I hope that he will understand better the needs to defend this nation as we are still involved in conflict in, Iraq, in Afghanistan. We face a major crisis with Iran over their continued development of nuclear weapons. We just saw their ability, the Iranian ability, to commit acts of terror all over the world, the latest being in Bulgaria. The fact that Syria is now coming apart and in danger of, of, because of this administration's failure to lead, that there can be chemical weapons not only spread around Syria, but also in other places as well. There is a danger of chemical weapons that are presently under Bashar Assad's control from flowing to Hezbollah presenting a grave threat to the security of Israel. All of these things are happening in the world without this body acting on the most important piece of legislation as far as our national security is concerned, and the majority leader of the United States Senate has decided not, to, apparently has decided not to bring it up and wants to bring up cybersecurity instead. It's a grave injustice, a grave injustice to the men and women who are serving this nation and sacrificing so much. I hope that the majority leader of the Senate, who by right of his position and in the majority, decides the agenda for the United States Senate, will change his mind and bring up the defense authorization bill, which I assure him we can have passed by this body, as always, in a near unanimous vote, if not totally unanimous vote, for the benefit, the security of this nation. Mr. President, I yield the floor. I suggest the absence of court. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.